Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tradesman Experience. This is the podcast built by Tradesmen for Tradesmen. My name is Josh, and one of the handsome guys in the studio today is, of course, Mr. <laughs> Nate Newton, the handsomest. Uh, of course. Dude, it's good to see you again. Uh, yeah, dude, it's it's been weird not being in here, and uh, you know, one week off seems like an eternity. It does. You know? Not yeah. not hearing you telling us how much we're fucking up and not doing the right shit, you know? I was thinking about that uh, this week. I'm like, I haven't been down to Battleborn in a minute. Dude, we had a fire guy on Tuesday. Uh-oh. Yeah. yeah. We can talk about that later. Yeah. It's new. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I. What's weird is that the the longer we've gone on in business, the like because I I loathe firing people. Mm-hmm. I fucking hate taking somebody's livelihood away from them. But when when you go through the processes that we put forth on this podcast, and you give them every fucking opportunity to do whatever they can, they've made the decision at that point. And it was it was easy. Like here's your check. You're done. Goodbye. I think I, just by you saying that, I bet I already know who it is. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, so, I, but and it, I mean, that shit sucks. I fucking hate it. But I've learned to rip the Band-Aid off, right? Mm-hmm. Like when it comes down to executing that task, it's like, all right, we've done everything we fucking can. You can't get out of your own fucking way. So we're done. Yeah. Well, always erroring on the side of leadership. Yeah. Right. Right. Which right. sometimes that's grace and sometimes that's being abrupt. Mm -hmm. but still always erroring on the side of leadership and giving those individuals the opportunity Mm -hmm. to correct and prove that they're willing to fulfill their agreement, which means, you know, when you hire someone, when you go to work for someone, you are entering into an agreement, right? This is what I'm going to do. This, these are the responsibilities that I have, so on and so forth. And then in exchange, I will receive whether it's autonomy, money, mm-hmm. growth, whatever it is. There's yeah. it's an agreement. Right. And I wish actually wish people looked at their jobs more like an agreement, a two party agreement, mm-hmm. instead of like, well, I'll just fucking work for them and, and bah, bah, bah. Right. right. It's like, no, no. And then when you make the decision to not fulfill that agreement on your end, and the opportunity is continually presented to you to correct it and then you make the decision not to you're making the decision to not be there well just have ownership over what the fuck you're doing right right and that's that's where most of the shit falls apart is that people lack a sense of ownership for what their job is and i I mean it's Mm -hmm. uh, trying to trying to instill that with this younger generation and uh, this guy was much younger Mm -hmm. and i the, the problem is he came in fucking guns blazing right like guy was great for two weeks and then couldn't keep him off his fucking phone and it's like what the fuck happened Mm -hmm. you know and comfortability sets in and yeah you know it's also the like the culture we have the dynamic we have with all the people like there's a lot of shit talking and so i I feel like some people when they don't understand the shit talking they look at it as like oh nobody gives a fuck around here Mm. and it's like that's that's not the case in the slightest bit you know um it just helps make the day go that's very true. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of which, you guys just heard the Grim Reaper over here. So uh, let's go ahead and introduce today's guest, uh, Mr. Holden Jacqueline. Uh, worked with you for, fuck, dude. Fremont was what, 2012? 2013? Something like 2014. that? 2014. 2014. Yeah, mm-hmm. so that was the first time I ever got introduced to you. And I've told that story multiple times about you almost getting killed by that fucking pole jack. Yeah, I listened yeah. to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, holding the, if you wouldn't mind uh, telling the listeners who you are, you know, a little bit about yourself. Well, hell, who am I? <laughs> That's a fucking question I've been asking myself for a long time. Um, well, I first got introduced to welding when I was probably 18, 19 years old. Uh, a buddy of mine, JT, I'm sure that you've talked about uh-huh. him on the podcast. It was after high school. He calls me up, and I didn't really have a lot going on, doing odd jobs, shit on the side. And he goes, hey, you want to you wanna come to work for my dad? He just started his company, and he's uh, he's hiring people. He's looking to you know fill some positions. And I go, fuck, I'm not, I'm not doing anything right now. I'll, I'll, I'll take you up on that offer. I'll, yes, I'll go to work for him. He goes, okay, well, pack your bags. Make sure you got some car hard coats because it's cold in New Mexico. And uh, meet me out there tomorrow. I go, oh, shit. 
here we go. Packed a bag and went out there and I was pretty broke. So I was pretty stuck out there. You know, once I got out there, <laughs> that's how they get you. Yeah. <laughs> they get you like that. It was good for me. Right. It was good for me. I was an well, Cause you guys were building what rock quarries or something like that. Yeah. We were building uh sand and gravel plants for Vulcan materials. And it was, it was on a plant. Um, uh, they called it the Santo Domingo plant. It was on the Santo Domingo Indian Reservation, just out of Al- Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> for, got on the truck, drove out there. The first week I worked, I did eighty six hours, and uh, I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> that, that'll make a man out of you real fucking quick, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember driving down the interstate, going to work. And I'm falling asleep while I'm driving, and I'm like, "Holy shit! Can I even make it through this week, right. this day? <laughs> maybe I, maybe I'll crash on the way." You know, <laughs> never, never end up crashing, but well, not in that instance. Not, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you crash but plenty of other shit. Falling asleep, crash, and on the road. No, that's a bad. Yeah. That'd be bad. Well, I mean, especially look at you know we pipeline together for what four or five years at least yeah but and then you know we broke off and did our thing Mm -hmm. and you know you're still in the game and i think you're one of the most impressive tradesmen that i've ever met for the simple fact that there is no there is no it can't be done right when when it comes to something like we were fitting up that pipe we were we were doing a seismic upgrade in fremont and i mean this was brand new inch and three eighths thick what was it 10 foot diameter it was large diameter yeah, something like that but we're tying into a hundred year old line yeah and you fitting that thing up i'm like dude fuck this get the engineers out here tell them to fucking deal with it and then you leave this motherfucker in a trench for four hours and the things fit up it looks like the scene from hellraiser with all the chains and come alongs and straps and hooks and all that shit but there, there's i i want to say that you're the most get shit done motherfucker that i've ever met I like a good challenge. (laughs) Dude, and like having you on a crew is a fucking challenge too because you're just, you're going to fucking get, you're going to do what you do and we should probably just get the fuck out of the way, right? Sometimes. Sometimes. I I don't like it when people on job sites, they try to capitulate and they try to slow you down. Oh, hey, we got to reevaluate what's going on. What you're doing isn't safe or, and not that it, not that I'm always safe, you know, I'm, I'm no fucking saint when it comes to safety, but right, right. some contractors, they, uh, they try to crawl up your ass and fucking slow you down, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, and that the simple fact that you don't have, you don't have this fucking off switch that you see with a lot of people, right? Like, I mean, you and I have been together on projects for, you know, pushing 30, 35 hours straight through. And it's like, we're, we're the last two people on site. And then the trench collapses and we still kept working, right? We dug our own, we, the trench collapsed. Luckily I was on the other side welding. He's on the inside. I'm on the outside. The trench collapses on one side. Like he felt it. He felt the pipe move when that <laughs> shit came in. <laughs> and yeah. we just kept, we kept working. We just got it done. And I like, that's one of those things that, Being a business owner and witnessing what we did and the extents that we went through to do things and get them done. Well, it was, it's not in the, it's not in that next group of people, right? When I started working for Dean's. So before I worked for Dean's, I I worked for a gentleman named uh, Brian McGrath, my, my buddy's uh, dad. And there wasn't a, uh, there wasn't, there wasn't, we can't do it in the vocabulary, you know? Mm, Right. We found a way to get shit done. Yeah. And when I moved into pipelining, it benefited me, you know, Mm -hmm. because when you're on the trigger and you're welding, you're making money. Yep. And if you have to grab a fucking shovel and shovel a bell hole out because you have a slough off or, you know, part of the trench caved in a little bit, you just grabbed a shovel and did it. Right. You weren't like, hey, laborers, come over here and dig this out for me. And then stand (laughs) there with your fucking hands in your pockets, you know. Right, right. So where did that, where did that mentality originate from? Did you mature into that, or is that having to do with your upbringing? Um, I I didn't really think about much of that growing up, uh, about mentality of you know not being able to quit because I got kicked out of school, you know, so I I, I quit school. I didn't really have a uh, 
I don't really have a, a drive to be in school, mm-hmm. you know. But if I found trades some, are a great place for yeah, you. Dude. If I found something <laughs> that I liked doing, yeah, I I didn't stop, you know. And being around guys like Nate and you know all the guys that we worked with at Dean Certified Welding, and you know I met Nate or I met Matt through Nate. I, first, I heard stories about Matt. <laughs> yes, you know, I love Matt. First, I heard, heard stories about Matt. He's all my partner, Matt. He's back in Illinois, and I'm imagining this great big giant motherfucker, you know, which he is. <laughs> <laughs> but he's the nicest dude ever. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. yeah, he. It's disgusting because it's genuine. Like he's a genuinely a nice guy. Yeah, is that salt of the earth? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You know, usually the nicest guys that we meet working, they're always huge. They're always huge. We had a guy named uh, Bamber. Yeah, uh, Jared the Bamber. dude over there in Tennessee. Yeah, now. he's yeah. in Tennessee now, and he was, he was. I wouldn't want to get him mad, but <laughs> right, he right. was the, one of the nicest guys I've met too. You know, and you know, Coleman. Yeah, Coleman. Yeah, I thought that I was and. Every time we talk to somebody that Nate and or Matt worked with, I always try to figure out like timeline piece just from stories. But so you worked with Coleman was part of that. Yeah, group we, as well. we worked with Coleman, Jared Bamber. I never worked with Matt too much. We were on some jobs together and he kind of came back into Dean's, you know, at the tail end of or right before they they started Battleborn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Maybe maybe he was working there with us for about a year gotcha. or two. Yeah. Well, I mean, you came up and helped us out on our first big project too. We were doing that big cable railing up there in Meeks Bay. Yeah. You came up and I I still remember this clear as fucking day that all I gave a fuck about was the production. I'm like, fuck, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. Like, we gotta make this contractor happy. And Holden just stops in the middle of what he's doing, and he just walks over to the shoreline, and he's just looking at Tahoe. He's like, man, this is a cool fucking job site. And I'm like, dude, it is. And I haven't looked up once. No, it's a gorgeous <laughs> job site. When I was out yesterday out mm-hmm. there, they're working on a multi million dollar home mm-hmm. right on the you guys, shoreline. You guys in Glenbrook? Yeah, yesterday. Glenbrook, yeah. 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 I mean, when the hell do you I told uh Hunter, mm-hmm. I was all this is this must be one of the most beautiful, gorgeous places on planet Earth. Mm-hmm. And you we're just hanging out, working, yeah. you know. Yeah. Welcome to Billionaire's Playground. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got to stop and enjoy that a little bit. I agree. Yeah. Well, because, I mean, when we were pipelining, we got stuck in the shittiest fucking places on the face of the planet. Like, I don't know if anybody knows where Mojave, California is, but, like, Jarbo, or was that Jawbone Canyon? It's a big OHV area, but there's fucking tweakers everywhere. The only thing that's really there is, like, a FedEx facility. I'd rather be there than L.A. any day. Oh, fuck L.A., dude. Jesus Christ. Inner cities... Yeah. Any, I mean, we work, we, we work in an environment where you're building the infrastructure. So you're constantly in inner cities mm-hmm. and I don't like inner cities, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Did you get stuck out on that Edison job with us out in uh what was that? Joshua tree. I no, I wasn't out there. Okay. But it, it was two hours between facilities we're in the middle of the desert, and to go from one hydro facility to the next, mm. it was a two-hour drive. So you spent two hours on site welding galvanized bullshit together? I love welding galvanized. Oh, I'm sure you do. You look like you love welding galvanized. <laughs> <laughs> and then you would just drive across the fucking desert, go to the next facility, mm-hmm. do the same thing, and you just – it was really weird. But you – this this job has taken us to some really incredible places. Like we got, you know, we went up to Canada for two years. You guys got stuck on that fucking New York job for shit. That was almost two years, right? We we're on we we're on that job on and off for two years. Yeah. I was out there. the The first go around was probably seven months, six months, something like that. Shit, staying out there. Yeah, that doesn't mean we Matt and I went up and helped build the TBM for that job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the tunnel boring machine, and we got stuck in there to go. Welled up the last little bit after they like lowered it off of its stands while it was being constructed. They lowered it down and like one little area had to be welded. Matt and I down Matt and I were down there for twenty eight hours and the entire cutting head is covered in grease. Well, they pump grease into it. You yeah. Know? It has right. 
they have 55 gallon drums that they pump grease out of uh, while they're boring Mm -hmm. you know yeah so it can be a filthy mess Mm. yeah it's fucking disgusting i don't know a lot of your listeners might not know but i mean they lower they lowered this particular tunnel boring machine down in pieces it's in several segments and they weigh anything from what three, four hundred thousand pounds up yeah. to five hundred. You know, yeah. I think that, and the, they lower the cutting head down. They have to move it in the starter tunnel, and you're moving all this shit around with fucking with gantries. Yeah, and, with yeah. I mean, it looks pretty <laughs> janky. Yeah, it looks pretty <laughs> janky. It's, very, very primitive. Yeah, it, it's very, very primitive. Interesting. It's a multi-billion dollar project that you're using chain falls to move a right. couple hundred thousand pounds. Everything about mining is difficult. Yeah. Especially the miners. God damn, is that a weird group of <laughs> motherfuckers, dude? Yeah, dude, I mean, I'm multi-generational. I yeah. come from miners, so I have friends back in the Midwest that still mine. Yeah, I mean, there's something about being underground all day that just fucks people up. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, all they, all they eat is pickle kippers. <laughs> like... I, I've never seen a miner eat anything other than a pickle kipper. It's like a little piece of fish, and they just interesting. I'm like, okay, you learn some stuff when you go to those places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did uh, Holden? Did you grow up in the trades, like from a kid, or my dad was a mechanic while okay. I was growing up, yeah. so I was constantly wrenching on stuff with him, and we rode motorcycles. So mm-hmm. you know, I've been riding since I was young. And every time something broke, we would fix it. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't have a lot. Of, we did it the, we did it ourselves because we couldn't afford, mm-hmm. you know, spending a bunch of money on luxury shit. Yeah. So, growing up, you know, and he he worked for a line stop company too while I was growing up. So I was always hanging out with older guys that were welders and had welding rigs and interesting. He did a lot of the fleet maintenance on this company's um, trucks and everything. So growing up, I was always doing something Mm -hmm. with him. You know, summertime, I'd be going to work with him. Yeah. Waking up at five. You know, I I think that my dad actually probably from a young age kind of introduced me to working. And he'd always set me up with stuff. He'd go, oh, hey, so-and-so down the street needs uh," he had like an acre of lawn. Go, go grab that push mower and go mow that shit, you know, Mm -hmm. make a little bit of money. Always had money when I was a kid. Yeah. So. Well, that, when Nate talks about you, and even in this conversation about you figuring things out and, you know, getting things done, uh, I'm always curious if that is just like nature or nurture, right? Is it something that you are built with? Is it something that you learn as you grow and mature? Because I think, I mean, first of all, to be in the trades successfully, you have to have a a me- what I call a mechanical mindset. Like you have to be able to look at something and uh, it's like Jarvis on like an Iron Man, right? Like right. you mentally understand how this thing works. And so you can start to diagnose it or correct it. I think that's necessary in, in, to be successful in the trades. What interests me is the different levels that people are able mm-hmm. to operate with that mindset. Well, and I'll tell you right now, after working with him for as long as I have, it's just hold it. Like there, there's nobody else out there running around doing what Holden does. Like I remember when you showed up in Fremont to do that tie in and I, I'm standing there watching him. He's just standing on top of the trench, just staring at this fucking mm-hmm. thing. And I can see the wheels turning in his head and he grabs like four things out of his truck and heads in the hole. Yep. Like he knew exactly what he was doing when he got there. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the other thing that I appreciate is, um, you put a lot of value in action. Well, you got to try different stuff to see right. what works. Mm-hmm. You're not going to sit down on a piece of paper and be like, oh, we're going to bend this one inch metal over here. It doesn't seem possible, you know, mm-hmm. but metal's very bendy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with So getting into welding and, and again, being the son of a mechanic, it's, it, it's ironic because my youngest brother, his dad is a mechanic. And TJ mechanically is one of the smartest people I've ever met. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's interesting that you have that similarity. Um, But for you to be able to just compound that kind of that natural state of get shit done or figure things out and then grow that in the, in the, in the welding industry. 
Welding's cool because you get to do whatever you want. You're all, oh, hey, I need to move this piece. So you can just weld a fucking bracket on it and you can put a bottle jack in there, you know? It's yeah. it's way easier than mechanicing. So is that your was that one of your attractions to that industry? Yeah, you get to do whatever you want. <laughs> you just get to make it up as you go. Well, hold on, hold on. Until the inspector shows up, that's when you don't get to do yeah. whatever the fuck you want. It depends want. on who it is. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> you were the one that taught me how to run 732-6010. We were doing quarter-inch joints out in Fresno, and Holden came out. I had never, I hadn't really run much 6010 at that point. And so I was like trying to figure it out. I was kind of making a mess out of it. So he shows me how to run it with three sixteenths. And I'm like, cool, fuck yeah. And he's all, hold on, check these big bastards out. And these 732 rods are what, 14 inches long? Yeah. They're, they're 14. fucking huge. It's like a cigar. You can single pass a quarter inch joint and just whip it and dab it. And, and I dude, wish I knew what you were saying yeah, right now. <laughs> dude, but, the, <laughs> but dude, we were getting 16 joints a day. Yeah, you you can you can get some welding done on it. I uh went after that Fremont job. It wasn't really wrapped up because we were going kind of back and forth. I was on a job in Fontana and I was working for a contractor by the name of CCL. Mm-hmm. And the owners were always on site. It was uh Jim and Jim Corbett and uh Tom Carmichael. And when I met these guys, they were expecting uh, Mike's brother, Bruce, to be out there. Ooh. And I pulled up, and they're digging in the middle of the street. I don't know what the fuck I was doing. You know, I didn't know what I was getting into. They just sent me there. And uh, Tom comes out, and he goes, you're our welder? And I go, yeah. And he goes, where the fuck is Bruce? And I go, I don't know where Bruce is. <laughs> and he goes, well, can you wipe your own ass? And I was like, yeah, I, th- I think so. He's all, well, that's better than the last fucking guy did. <laughs> And I was all, fuck, this guy's, he's intense, you know, but those old school guys kind of get that, you know, they want to test you out Mm -hmm. before they even have you working to see if you're a pussy or not. Yep. And I kind of appreciate that about the old school guys. They'll chew your ass if you fuck something up and then it's done. They don't Mm -hmm. fucking carry it into the next day. Yeah. It's not like dealing with your wife. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so what I love about that is that's what I was introduced to at about 10 or 11. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's how I was brought up in the trades is that that old school. And it's hilarious now because I think back of some of the guys that I uh, worked with as I was growing up through the trades. And, you know, when you're especially 11 and 12, I mean, I look at 11 year old today and I'm like, I was doing what when I was their age, but. <laughs> But eating paint chips, they, you know, I, they were always old guys to me, you know, it's like all the old guys. Well, fuck, they were like my age now, right? You are the old guy. I'm the old guy now. Um, but, but I, I agree. I, I have that same level of respect. It's like, you're going to get your ass chewed when you need to have it chewed and then it's over. It's, Mm -hmm. it's done. There's no drama there. You know, there's no, this isn't a ripple effect. It's not a lingering Mm -hmm. effect. They're different guys. When they take the hard hat off, they mellow out. But at work, it's all fucking business. Yep. And you shouldn't take it personal when a guy chews your ass because you're either That's fucking right. something up. And I've also seen where an old timer will chew your ass. And if you're not, if you didn't do that and you bark back at him, he'll respect you more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that's mm-hmm. an interesting dynamic of that relationship, too, because mm-hmm. you're right. They um, re- you, you got to know when it's appropriate to do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. you do. The first year, you just need to shut the fuck up. I agree. Right? <laughs> right? You don't want to go in like barking back because you're going to, well, in our day, you would have caught a wrench or something. To well, the most head, of but, the time, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> that's that's all the time for me. So, yeah. It's, <laughs> I'm yeah, still working in that still, realm. <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And recognizing, you know, it's like you don't have to. You don't have to battle for the alpha position. What you need to do is earn a position. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you don't have to prove what you know and don't know. Well, and that's that's the thing about you that that's one of those things like we this this is a, a leadership based podcast, right? Mm-hmm. Your first job was on my crew in Fremont. Yeah. And we went to a couple different places, but I at no point did I ever feel like I was your leader. I was like, Well, this thing needs to be done and Holden's gonna go do it. Like you're kind you didn't of this feel like dude. you were his boss. Yeah, I, like he was just kind of a lone wolf, and he was, but he was a lone wolf that was getting shit done. So mm-hmm. it's like, 
You know, as much as we preach culture and all that kind of stuff, there are people that do exist in this realm that just fucking do the goddamn work, right? That they, so, they, they, you just, yeah. you, they're better off left alone than they are being led. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I appreciate you saying that because it really circles back to something that I wanted to, that I started off talking about, but it's like, what is that internal narrative holding? Like, why is that the performance that you choose? You got to want to get it done just as much as everybody else on the job site wants it. You know, if you don't want it, you don't have any fire in you, you know, it. So what is it that attracts you about? Is it the result? Is it getting done? Is it having that satisfaction of completing? Is it knowing the like, or, or, you know, is it like, well, I need to get this done because I don't, I'm not going to depend on somebody else. Like what? What are the variables that come into play? And I know we're, this isn't, you know, I feel like I've got you on the couch right now, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious because when you, you know, it, it's, it's pretty rare when I, when I talk to somebody like Nate, I talk to somebody like Matt, I talk to somebody like Coleman, who, you know, those are three guys right there that I know are high performers that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. And when there's a common name that gets tossed around yours um, of like, it's like, well, the, this is like Holden's the next level. Like, he, mm-hmm. like ever, those guys I know respect you and, and how you're able to work and perform and think and get shit done. So like, I'm just trying to figure out like, what does that sound like? Like, what do you, is it just like how you're fucking wired? And you're like, I don't even think about it. I just fucking do it. I don't really think about it. <laughs> so, no, yeah. I don't dude, really think that's holding right. No, there. dude, and that, that's the best answer you could have given. Because I'm working with you for as long as I have. I wish people could see the confused look on his face yeah. from that ridiculous yeah. question yeah. I like, just asked. What do you mean? Like I just do the shit. Yeah. yeah. But but I but that's why I hold the respect that I have for you. It's because like when you show up, it's do or fucking die. Mm-hmm. There is no fucking in between. There is no gray area. It's just we're gonna fucking get this thing done. I mean, you remember being out in Vegas when we were out there at Lake Mead. And it's yep. 120 degrees on the bench. Dude, we're just burning. We're fucking mm-hmm. going. And we're welding the whole fucking time. And they're, dude, and I'm not going to fucking give up in front of this motherfucker. That's for sure. I ain't well, going to let him fucking win. It's camaraderie, too. You know, you don't want to fucking yeah. let. So you're on a crew with four guys and you're all, you're all equals on a job. You know, mm-hmm. you're not, you don't have one guy fucking dictating to you what you should or shouldn't be doing. You're working as a team to accomplish the goal Mm -hmm. and if you puss out you're fucking leaving your work for the other guy to do (laughs) right yeah yeah it's almost like you ever seen that you ever seen that scene in uh full metal jacket where they beat the dude with the with the soap the soap oh yeah Yeah. (laughs) like some dudes deserve that (laughs) you can't you don't you don't want to leave all the shit that you know, if there's a crew of six guys out there and you guys mm-hmm. divide it up so everybody can get out of there at the same time and some dude just pussies out and fucking leaves, dude, we're all going through the same shit. It's 120 right. degrees out and we're welding. You don't want to, you well, don't want to get in your truck and haul ass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, I mean, that's like the definition of an uh, definition of embrace the suck, right? Like we're all suffering together and you know that if you fucking bitch out, that all those other guys are going to be sitting there picking up the fucking slack that you left. And they're and not going to call you on to the next one. Exactly. But you what, know? so what is it that, that keeps you from quitting? There's a bit of some competitive nature, you know, working a, a, a bit. Yeah. There's a bit of it. <laughs> yeah. There, there's some stuff that I can't win. I mean, there's some guys, there's some guys at Dean's that can fucking, they can beat me at it. You know, a lot of shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. I like Nate Schultz, the fucking golden arm. The golden arm. I yeah. I met Nate. I yeah. met him once. That dude's just ungodly. Like I I don't know where the fuck that dude got his arm from, but that dude that dude could weld from six o'clock to twelve o'clock without ever coming off of the trigger on an eighty four inch joint. Like he yeah. would reach down and do it in glass. I like, I, perfect. I tried that. I couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that dude's just a freak of fucking nature, man. I yeah. don't I don't know where the fuck he came from, but I'm not sure yep. he's human. Well, what I appreciate about that, Holden, is like, you know, what what Nate's talking about right now is like, that's a tremendous skill, right? To be able to to lay on the trigger in in that entire joint, but also problem solving, figuring things out, having that intuition, and then 
that almost unstoppable action to generating the result it is also equally as valuable mm-hmm. right as the skill so it's like i i get the competitiveness because you do want to be the best at everything but recognizing like what your strengths are what your gifts are like what are you the best at and if the best is like we're going to fucking get it done like a, a if I, if there's a team that has a whatever it takes guy on there like that's a great compliment to the shit that everybody else brings to the table. I think that even if you're slower, even if you weld slower or whatever, any 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 part uh, any dynamic of the job that we do, if if you're not the best at it, mm-hmm. um, I think that as long as you don't quit when shit gets fucking shit starts sucking, yeah. Mm-hmm. So does that? Does that bitch voice creep in on you when shit gets tough and you're like, God, I don't want to fucking do this. I'd rather quit. You know, when I get mad, <clears throat> I'll get, I'll get fucking pissed at contractors. You're like, it's you're adorable d- when it gets mad too. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're down in a hole and you're fucking laying in two feet of water and there's mm-hmm. water spraying out of this fucking pipe that you're trying to weld. And you're like, Hey, are you fucking idiots going up the fucking pipeline and trying to s- shut valves off? They're like, we did all we can do. <laughs> I just start getting pissed, you know? And I just want to get the job over. Mm-hmm. I don't want to leave. I don't, I'm, if I'm out representing Dean certified welding, I don't want to fucking bitch out and leave this fucking water fucking shooting out of a fucking pipe and roll my shit up and just be like, fuck you guys. I'm out of here. Which is something that we've seen. Uh, far too many fucking times where somebody just drags up and they fucking lose their shit and they're like, this is too hard. I'm done. And it's it, like, who the fuck do you think is going to come do this? It's, oh, the, it's Holden. Yeah, <laughs> it's the easy. It's the fair I think weather. That, I think that taking the easy route's always the fucking bitch way. Mm-hmm. And yep. it's easy to be all, Oh, I'm not laying in the mud and doing this. I'm just going to get in my truck and fucking drive home. And then your whole drive home, you're thinking, what, how am I such a pussy? You know? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure those no, guys they're, they're have not, that narrative. No, I don't think they question. They, yeah. I think it's more of an ego conversation being like, yeah, fuck those guys. Uh, they're not making me get in there. I think the whole ride home is justifying their action, mm-hmm. not well, yeah. not evaluating it. I've had I've had that experience too, you know? I uh, not Not too long ago, probably a year or so ago, um, I got sent out to, a. I won't name the contractor, but I got sent out to a job near, near the border in San Ysidro. And we were welding these five eighths round plates on these, uh, concrete columns that they were using for pile. And it, I was out there for two days and one of the, one of the loader operators was all, Hey, move your truck out of the way. And there were two excavator buckets kind of shoehorned in mm-hmm. behind this pile of steel in my truck and i move my truck out of the way and the dude proceeds to get in there with his loader and just smash i had an umbrella set up because it was in you know in mexico so i'm welding under an umbrella <laughs> and he's smashing the shit out of it with his bucket and i just threw my hands up in the air at him like made a gesture at him and he just throws it in reverse and hauls ass with this bucket oh what a fucking douchebag so the next day rolls around, and uh, he wants to get that other bucket in there. So I'm moving my truck out of the way, and I'm rolling my shit up kind of slow <laughs> just to be a dick, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm moving all my shit out of the way. So I start my truck, and I'm walking over to the loader to talk to him. And I'm like, hey, dude, I, I was going to tell him not to be running into my equipment, that we pay for all of our own shit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not company shit. Don't treat my stuff like shit. And... As I'm walking over to the loader, his, so the dirt foreman for the same company was like two different, you know, we're in two different, I I was being instructed what to do from another entity at the company. And another one of the foremans comes up and says, Hey, get your fucking truck out of the way right now. And I was all, I'll get my truck out of the way, but I want to talk to your loader operator because yesterday he was running into my equipment. Did he break it? No, he didn't break it, but it still doesn't make it good. Mm -hmm. So I want to have a conversation with him and he's all, get your fucking truck out of the way. And I said, I'm going to get my truck out of the way for good. He's all good. Roll up your shit and get the fuck out of here. And I said, perfect. 
went to my truck, filled out a four hour minimum ticket. Mm-hmm. Now he's over there conversing with the guy that is my contact for this uh, contractor. And I go up and I go here, here's my four hour minimum ticket. And, uh, he goes, I didn't tell you to leave in front of this other guy. And I, I lost my shit. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my shit. Yeah. You know? yeah. Which is, <clears throat> as I'm getting older, I'm getting better at controlling myself in a situation like that. But, uh, it's difficult. <laughs> Dude, it's difficult. Hold on. I remember him when he fucking first started. And dude, there'd be some shit that would send you off the fucking off the deep end, right? Yeah. And like I know by the end of my pipeline career, the complete 180, you would like if you want to talk about personal growth and personal development, I think you've come like you've done the hardest part that most people don't understand and that's controlling your emotion. Like when you started, you were kind of a, you know, kind of a kid. Almost. I was definitely a kid. I was 23. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you were a fucking firecracker. You were full of piss and vinegar. You took shit from nobody. And then when we got out to, like, Vegas, I remember that you had toned down so much. And I'm like, what the fuck happened? Well, it's, you know, it fucking hurts you in the long run, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I freak out on this contractor. He's standing there in front of this other guy that's my contact. And he's like, oh, I, I didn't tell you to roll up. You did that by yourself. I said, I didn't fucking roll my truck up by myself because I just wanted to. You told me to get the fuck off your job site. So here's my ticket and sign it. He's all, I'm not signing it. I go, I'm going to fucking, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it <laughs> yeah. wasn't a good conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had veins popping out of my neck and I started knifing him <laughs> yeah. and I'm watching myself and I'm all, I need to take a step back. And I had to get away from him. Mm-hmm. Long story short, he ended up signing the ticket and we did not leave on good – I did not leave on good terms. And I'm thinking about it on my drive home. I'm all, hmm. Not a good image for the company that I'm working for, you know? But at least you give a fuck about that. It's not a good image. You mm-hmm. know, I'm out. There's other ways to go about – there's other ways to go about it. Losing your fucking cool is not What would you do ways. differently in that situation now? I actually thought about that long and hard. And uh, I think that a way more badass way to go about it would to be to repossess your welds. You know? Oh, you don't want to sign my ticket and you're asking me to still leave? I'd just go torch them off. <laughs> Left it, let it fall <laughs> in the mud. Dude, the best part is, is Zach did that one time. There was a contractor flat out told him that he's like, I'm not going to fucking pay you. Zach went down with a scarfing tip, cut the whole, cut yeah. just the weld out, mm-hmm. left all of the base material. He's like, fuck you. Yeah, taking my welds yeah, with me. Take my welds with me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hey, you don't want to, you don't want to play ball, then you don't get, you don't get mm-hmm. our services, right? I mean, that's. Yeah. So here's, here's what I like about this for, in a, a way to continue is I, I appreciate this on all aspects the, the evaluation, the self awareness. Um, different tactics of solving the problem because I think that I think a lot of people just that listen to this podcast would probably believe um, and this may be false but might believe that like I I think that you should approach everything cool and calm and that's probably how they think I am <laughs> it is, it's like just approaching everything like cool and calm um, and, and I think there's absolutely necessity to turn up the volume yeah, dude there's a time to motherfuck somebody mm-hmm. I think there, that there's a time for it but that, I don't that think, wasn't the time for it is that what you're saying I, I don't think so yeah I don't think it was mm-hmm. was that just too quick like the, you're, you're you choosing that reaction was too quick I I don't think that threatening to kill people is a good way to try yeah. to do anything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know? What are you talking about? The U.S. Yeah. government's been doing it for the last 300 fucking years. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I just mean to have a recipro- reciprocal relationship with a client. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be fucking telling anybody that, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to kick their ass or anything. I mean, what if it comes down to that, why even work for them? Yeah. Well, I mean, there At was a, point. there like, I remember when I first started in the pipeline industry back in like 2006 or 2007, where there were a lot of those dudes out of the seventies that were there that they would put fucking hands on you. If you decide you want to pipe up like that. And honestly, like I've I watched dudes scrap on site and it was fucking 
done after that, Mm -hmm. you know? And I know that that's not the world we live in now. I know that's not the way it happens anymore, but when you were hanging, when you were dealing with fucking knuckle dragon, badass Mm -hmm. motherfuckers, that sometimes you had to get down like that. Luckily for me, I'm 250 fucking pounds. So like they yeah. thought twice about it, you know, which they probably would have whooped the shit yeah. out of me. But well, that goes back to me being that 12 year old kid I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Like I've been wrapped up, tied up, thrown in the dumpster. Yeah. Like when I, th- and by the way, at 12, I was probably four you looked foot like you were eight. eight. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, I looked yeah. like a, you know, a seven or eight year old. Like I was just a tiny, tiny person, but mm-hmm. you know, like when I would mouth up, like I'd get reminded real quick. Yeah, where you stand at in that fucking pecking order. Absolutely, but I but I do appreciate the fact that you are as analytical about that situation as you mm-hmm. possibly can be. But the fact that you thought about it and you thought about your the company that you represents reputation, like being a business owner, that means so much to me. When guys give a fuck on that scale. When it's yeah. it's not just us, it's them. They are like, I am this company. Well, it's dude, it's a weakness to lose your fucking cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but there's also moments for it, and if a dude's blatantly lying and fucking told you to fuck off, and then you come back and he's lying about it, I'm I'm not gonna lie, I'd probably lose my fucking shit too. Yeah, but but I'd probably but, be doing the same so, thing sitting in my truck, going, God, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. So other than torching the welds welds off, like. What, what does that conversation sound like to you now? Like, how different would that conversation go? I think that torching the welds off would just be, like, a badass story to tell. Right. <laughs> and then you wouldn't really you wouldn't really have the repercussion that you, you wouldn't... When you lose your shit, you look like an idiot. Mm-hmm. When you're over there yelling at a fucking dude because he won't sign a ticket, who fucking cares, you know? Yeah. Like, at that point... Does that four hours yeah, really mean yeah, that much, dude? I mean, does it right. really mean that much? So... I don't like looking like an idiot, mm-hmm. you know, that ain't good. Lo- well, why do you think the, the loader operator made that decision? It wasn't even the loader operator. I meant to like damage your shit the day before. Oh, fuck. He, people, people that are employees do not take care of company equipment. They think, you know, I've had guys just go through my truck. I dude, I fucking They'll, love oh, that word choice and people yeah. that are employees. Yeah. Employees do not respect the equipment. Like it's theirs. They never do. No, oh, and so I gotta, I gotta throw this out there. This I've, I've gone out. I used to stay at his house when he lived up in was it Anza? Yeah, yeah. So he was staying up in Anza, and I remember I was down there doing a fucking pipeline somewhere. I show up to this dude's house. It's a Saturday. He's in nothing but jeans and boots, and has a fucking what second gen Dodge stripped down to the fucking frame, and he's rebuilding this truck. And then I remember I came back like several months later. This truck is fucking immaculate, right? And you put what a common rail and twenty four valve and like yeah, twin did. turbo this fucking thing and like the truck was tinkering. Yeah, you but, still have it. Yeah, it's a, it's uh, parked at Nick's house right now. Yeah, awesome. But this truck is gorgeous. The first time you take it out on site, doesn't somebody drop a bucket on the fucking cab of that thing? Uh, no, they. So. <clears throat> Same contractor I was talking about, CCL. <clears throat> we uh, we were working in the street in um, Irvine, and they shut the street down at around 8 or 9 o'clock at night. They dug. We were putting in some 42-inch, I think, CMLC, uh, three, three-eighths wall. Concrete pipe, mortar line pipe. Concrete mortar line pipe, three-eighths wall, 42-inch. And uh, this particular section of the job, we had to – dip underneath some utilities so it was really deep 18 foot deep and the material was just sandy it was mm. really bad material so <clears throat> we're trying to get this last joint stabbed in and they had to have this road backfilled compacted and paved by 5 a.m and it's uh it's like three in the morning and we're tr- the the ditch just keeps caving in caving in caving in they clean it out it caves in again they run a loader out to their yard grab some plate to shore it up with plate and it you know they're fucking struggling and it's deep and they have a spreader bar on a 336 cat uh back uh track hoe and they're laying the pipe with that well they finally get this fucking thing cleaned out they got plates bent you know keeping the trench from caving in bunch of speed shores in there 
and they're trying to get this joint stabbed and it's a bell spigot joint and some of these pipe they come oblonged you know so they don't they they don't want to stab so the owner's out there and he's like hey get your fucking truck over you know everybody's kind of on edge like on pushing edge. Mm-hmm. and they're pushing because they got to have this fucking thing you know where cars can drive on it in an hour and a half and they haven't even started backfilling <laughs> It's not even welded yet. <laughs> it's not even the welding ain't. Yeah. You know that don't take long. But yeah. I can weld. I can weld while they're back filling. So yeah. what? You know whatever. They're trying to get it stabbed. Mm-hmm. So we have two lanes in the center of this road shut down. The three thirty six is in one connected to the pipe, and I pull back in in his blind spot. He's holding on the pipe trying to get it stabbed. So I that's the only place I could park. So I right in right in the blind spot of this excavator throw my leads out i get the top of this joint tacked on there so they can hinge it in and get it stabbed and uh everybody's on edge you know the 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 owners which is understandable Mm -hmm. you know they there's a bunch of people fucking they don't know what to do because fucking shit's getting intense and they get this pipe unhooked and he goes to swing the fucking spreader bar and set it on the curb and my truck's fucking right in his blind spot. And I mean, there's fucking five guys standing there watching this happen. So I fucking, they're all, Hey, Hey. And I peek out of the fucking trench and I just see my fucking truck up on two wheels with the fucking counterweight on it. I'm just all motherfucker. What are you uh, going to do? It's right, done. Exactly. Yeah. So I went yeah. in and welded that 42 inch joint and fucking hauled ass. They, they paid it. They paid for it, you know, but yeah, but that happened again. Like right after that too, though. Right. Didn't that cab get damaged a second time? Yeah. <laughs> so after that, um, I got the cab fixed and I put the welding bed on it and, uh, I was out at Kramer Junction with Charles Prince, mm-hmm. and we were welding some thirty. Chuck's inch. a great fucking dude, too. Yeah, yeah, another another great guy. He's a fucking sharp motherfucker. He is, yeah. So we're we're out there welding some thirty inch casing pipe at Kramer Junction that goes underneath that new fucking off on ramp deal mm-hmm. that they were putting up just for some future pipe that would eventually go under that overpass. And uh, I'm in the trench. We're brother in law in this. And I, some guys all, hey, welder. And I peek up out of the hole and they're like, the concrete truck just fucking dumped concrete all over your hood. He had all the chutes connected and he turned really sharp by my truck and just smacked the fender, went up the fender, over the hood. There's concrete all over it. And the dude's driving away. And I'm all, hey, motherfucker. (laughs) Dude, the... (laughs) He's trying to drive away. Yeah. Like, I still don't understand how you're able to find these bodies for these fucking trucks. I have a graveyard full of them. Yeah. But they're all, they're all tip top. Actually, the current one that I have on, on the work truck now, I, uh, I found a really clean 1500 on Craigslist for like 2000 bucks. I bought it and stole the cab off and put it on my truck. And then I put my smashed one back on the 1500 and then sold it. <laughs> so. Then you have a bunch of trash laying around my yard. <laughs> That's the mechanic in you. Mm-hmm. Having fucking body parts and truck parts and shit laying around. Dude, I'm watching this dude run around his yard shirtless with a full fucking transmission for a diesel truck in his hands. Just like waddling across his driveway. And I'm like, dude, I hope he doesn't ask me to help him. <laughs> I'm like, I'm ready to go to bed at this point. Being Being handy with mechanics... You're in a welding truck. The fucking thing's going to break down yeah. somewhere, you know? I don't like being broken down. Yeah. How long have you been welding now? Oh, for a living or? <laughs> well, you said you kind of started around 18 yeah. years old. I started around 18. I didn't do a lot of welding. Mm-hmm. Couldn't be trusted with it quite yet. I had to kind of grow into that. You weren't a welder yet? No. You were just welding? He knew how to weld. It <laughs> yeah. wasn't a welder. Yeah. Well, I told him I knew how to weld. And then well, when I got out there, he figured out pretty quick that I didn't know how to weld, you know. <laughs> but I bought a welding hood, and I'd watch those guys where I was working, when I was working for uh, Brian. And uh, eventually, you know, bought a welding hood and 
he, we we had all the trucks at the um, hotels, so if we had any spare time, I'd fucking strike up the welder and hmm. you know practice a little bit, talk a little bit of shit to everybody else that was practicing. Uh, hey, that looks like turkey shit. <laughs> oh well. It's weird because yeah. I'm sure he sounded just like that when he was 18. <laughs> it's almost like having Velada in yeah, here again. Right, right. Yeah. This is a little bit. Yeah. Um, so that's so. How long has that been then? It's been probably 13, 14 years. Okay. Yeah. And I've been working for Dean's for 10. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. Yeah. Damn, that's Something a good amount. That. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good amount of time. I made it 12. So. <laughs> Dude, that 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 job, like I did, I did love welding pipeline like it was a cool thing but i got tired of being on the run i got tired of being homeless i got tired of just never i didn't belong anywhere you know and when once you hit like 30 you're like what the fuck am i doing you know and there there were there's plenty of guys that made it into their 50s 60s yeah doing that line of work you know like uh steve jones rest his soul uh you know he was a fucking stand-up guy he just passed was, was it parkinson's or ALS. ALS, yeah. But, uh, Lou Garrett's disease. Yep. <clears throat> but the dude was just fucking knew it all, you know. He spent – he de- devoted his life to this trade. And, you know, Bruce, uh, who was – you know, Mike Dean was the guy that owned the company. Bruce was his brother who actually built Big Red. He's the one that built the bed on Big Red. Gary Schultz. Gary Schultz. Dude, this dude had a fuck. How old was he when that trench plate got dropped on him? I don't know. Dude, he must have been in his 50s. He's an old devil dog out of out of San Diego, dude. And he had a one-inch thick trench plate dropped on him, fucking flattened him out. And that dude, what was it, a couple weeks later, he was back in the trench working again? I'm not really familiar with the story. No. But no. I, I've heard that he had a trench plate smash him. Yeah. Well, they called him the animal. Dude, that dude would outwork any fucking 22-year-old that ever showed up. If he knew you were younger and more capable, he fucking doubled down, and he got after it just to make you look like a bitch. He he works for Boutier now, a uh, mm-hmm. third-party inspection for yeah. some, a lot of these water districts. Hopefully he's out of the field. He's getting way too old for that shit. He's not welding. He's just... Just inspecting. He, yeah, he's an inspector. It's pretty good yeah. to see him. You know? but we So, I mean, we got, we got this fortunate position of like we got to see the last of the dying breed we got to see these guys that were just fucking pipe hitting motherfuckers mm-hmm. right and these guys got after it and we got to work side like al and all those guys like we yeah. got to work side by side with these guys and dude that shit wore off on us right like we mm-hmm. we picked some of that up along the way we're operating in a completely different world completely different market completely different industry as you know there's a lot of shit that's been automated and whatnot but all the shit that those guys taught us how to do by hand, it wasn't just doing that one task that they taught us how to do. It's the the conceptual understanding that rippled into everything else that we did. And when people are like, oh, well, why do I need to know this when we have these automated processes that will take care of all this other shit? And it's like, how do you explain that to somebody? Mm-hmm. You know, like it, it, it it's not as easy – is like, oh, you're gonna understand your the rest of your job better by knowing this. And they're like, if you, anything that you can get information on is gonna help you on your job. Yeah. We uh, last year in January we went out to Portland, Oregon, uh, to the Northwest Pipe Manufacturing Facility, and uh, they go, hey, will you guys go out there for a little while? And I. I said, yeah, hell yeah, you know, I'll go out there, probably learn some stuff. He goes, they're gonna, they're, they're cutting miters and building um, bends for 108 inch pipe, and I was all, fuck yeah, that's cool. I thought when I got out there that they would just have a giant bandsaw cutting these angles on these fucking like giant pipes, and we get out there and it's this old Russian guy marking it all out by hand, and cut. I mean, the guy was a fucking wizard, you know. He's probably in his 60s, and I just. JT and I just kind of congregated around his station to learn like what the fuck he was doing. Yeah. What is, what does that equation look like? Right. It's actually pretty handy, you know? Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Well, and uh, it's, it's one of those things that that there's a reason why that 60 year old guy is just on layout. Right. I mean, layout's your most critical aspect of any trade, right? He would lay these joints out, Nate, and we'd turn them around and slap them up against one another, mm-hmm. and it would be the perfect angle, with oh, no shit. no gaps in your weld or anything, God. you know. How do you teach that? 
I think that you have to have an interested party because there were young, there were young men in that facility that mm-hmm. they didn't know what the fuck he was doing. And we spent a month there. And by the time I was done, I had fucking taken all the information that I could from the guy and I used mm-hmm. it in the field several, yeah, several man. times since. Well, <clears throat> let me, let me ask a different question along the same line. How, how do you generate that interest? How do you how do you build that hunger in someone that wants to truly own their craft? You could use it in anything. I mean, if you want to miter a fucking I beam, you use the same math. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. So when you're in the field, and you can calculate out how to miter a piece of pipe, and you know, you have these contractors that have these fucked up tie-ins. And they're all, oh, my God, what are we going to do? And they call Dean's up, and they send me out there. And I'm just, oh, hey, we can miter it here and here. And then you cut it all out, and it just fits in there fucking perfect. Those guys are all, God damn, that's fucking badass. Wizardry. And they want to call you back, <laughs> yeah. you know? They, right. They want that. Well, I mean, we did. you did that shit when we were in uh, Fremont. Remember that last tie-in that we did? We were with Chris Boyer. Yeah. And that the, the tie-in shows up, and it's like 18 inches off. The pipe are on uh, spring line. They're 18 inches off. Holden goes in there and just starts cutting fucking pipe apart. He's all, here, that'll fix it. And they're like, oh, we got to get you it know, didn't engineer fit. approval yeah. and this and that. And it's like, that. and Chris Boyer was just like, fuck it, send it. Throw it in there. We're going to backfill it today. Do it I didn't really know what I was doing. I just kind of like <laughs> fucking eyeballed it, you know. It worked. It worked. It's a lot better when you can actually lay it out properly. Mm -hmm. And I always kind of had an interest in learning how to do that, but I never had anybody that was willing to spend the, I mean, spend the little bit of time that it took to show you how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I ran into a guy like that in Portland, you know, but I, I think, I think your whole point of the receptive party that when you're the receptive party, you pick up on it so much faster as opposed to any other asshole that works in that facility that let's say you even forced him into it. Like you need to fucking learn this because this guy's going to retire next amount of time. The amount of time it takes to teach that motherfucker as opposed to you is very different. I don't think that a lot of people that are in a position where they're working at a facility and they're welding this pipe. I don't think that they're thinking into the future very much, Mm -hmm. you know? And when you learn parts of your craft that make you, kind of irreplaceable, you know, or the more that you can add to your resume, as far as what, you know, mm-hmm. the harder it is to, uh, the, the harder, it, the harder it's going to be to replace you. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, your knowledge is your bargaining chip, right? Yeah. Like if they're like, Hey, we're going to send you out to this job. Well, what's it paying? It's paying this much. I ain't showing up for that much. Yeah. You have a fucking leg to stand on, right? If if you feel like the numbers are too low or however the fuck it works. I think I I, I listen to a lot of Jordan Peterson podcasts mm-hmm. and Jocko, and he makes a good point. If you're not willing to tell somebody to go to hell, it's really hard for you to be able to negotiate with them. Yeah. I mean, you have to be willing to receive the consequences of saying no on you a do. negotiating table. Yep. Right. And I mean, we deal with this in business all the time. Where it's like, well, if you don't do it for this amount, we're not going to give you the job. And it's a fucking million dollar job. You're like, okay. We're not going to go out there and fucking do it for free, right? And so we've come to terms with the with what the consequences are of not getting what we need. And we're going to – what we need is what we need. We don't budge on that. Our prices are non-negotiable, right? Like that's what we show up for. We're not going to go do this for half price. We're not going to go do this outstanding job for half of what – we should have made on it. It's hard to put a price on being able to negotiate, I think. Yeah. Well, I know with my arrogant ass that if you want to ask me what my time is worth, I'm fucking, you can't afford it, motherfucker. <laughs> like, you know, so I mean, you have to be realistic about it, right? But at the end of the day, you know what you need in order to make it worth your while to fucking show up every day. Yeah. So, dude, you don't win them all. Dude, I don't even win half of them. So. And, I mean, you you guys probably know that more than anybody, starting your own business and having to be able to bid a job and recognizing how much shit is actually involved in it. Mm-hmm. I mean, on a, 
on a lot of jobs, it doesn't seem like they put enough cushion in it. Right. Or if yeah. there's something that gets tr- dramatically fucked up that we call that contingency time. Yeah. yeah that you're still going to make money. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, we, we took it in the ass a bunch of times because we were like, well, we just want to get the job. We want to get our name out there. We want to get our foot in the door. It's a learning experience. Fuck, dude. That, and it, dude, learning expenses or experiences are expensive as fuck. Mm-hmm. They really are. But now that we've been at this for six years, we're like, dude, we don't have to do any of this shit anymore. It's like either we fucking make money or we don't fucking show up. Yeah. Full stop. And we, I mean, we know how much we need to make to make it worth our fucking time because we've got other options. We've got other places we can go. We've got other things we can do. But when we're like, oh, we need to get this million dollar project. And it's like, okay, well, you got your million dollar project that you're making 5% on. I could have done four smaller projects, $250,000 projects at 20%. Mm-hmm. There, what's, what's interesting about what you're saying, if someone listening is like, well, that seems kind of arrogant. It is. Then I would. Well, <laughs> uh, there's. I, I think you have to have confidence, but what you what you can't have is a scarcity mindset. Right. And that's what people fall into is a scarcity mindset, and they feel that they have to say yes, and they have to commit to the yes, mm-hmm. so they have the work, and they're not really focused on on what their value is and what their value is worth. What problem are they solving? Are they in their lane? You know, a lot of things that you and I, Nate, that we discuss often on here. So, you know, if, if somebody's like, well, that's really arrogant, be like, uh, then I would challenge you to identify if you have a scarcity mindset or not, or what is your business plan? And, yeah. and is if there is a misalignment where you don't think that you can go in, and, and I'm not talking about demanding prices, and I know right. that's not what you're talking about. Right, what right. you're really yep. talking about is knowing your worth and keeping that at the table. Right. And if someone isn't it's doesn't, a standard. doesn't it's a think standard. that your standard is the best fit for them at that price point or whatever metric they're using, then that's okay. Then you're not the right person. Yeah. Well, and it, it, like that word arrogant keeps coming up and I've been called arrogant a lot in my life. Shocked. And I've noticed I'm that shocked. <laughs> everybody that calls me arrogant, they're people that don't fucking do shit. Yeah. Like my confidence mm-hmm. is it's, it's seen as arrogance, right? And I, I completely understand why they see it that way. It's because they don't do shit. Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, you fucking think you're better than everybody else because you did this, this, and this? Like, not everybody else, but then you? Yes. Yeah, I, yeah I'm better than you. Yeah. This moment? Yeah. Holden, there's something you said I wanted to, <clears throat> to jump into a little bit. You said a lot of people don't think about their future as far as like learning. First question is, why do you think that's the case? Because I actually agree with you, and you said it, and I was like, oh, I, I want to jump down this rabbit hole. Because I, I believe I, I believe that to be the case. Oh, uh, I don't know. You go you go to the same job, and you have the, ever, you know, the same struggle every day, and you're just trying to make it through that fucking eight hours or whatever. Oh, I can't wait till the weekend where I can go get fucked up or, you know, whatever. So, it, it, I love it's it. such a waste of life, yeah. you know? Fuck, learn how to do something that's going to make you more valuable. And if you don't want to even be there, fuck, go do something else. Go get another job that you enjoy. Yeah. Welding's not a fit for everybody. Mm -hmm. And dude, it can get fucking boring, you know, just holding a trigger, looking through a little fucking two by four window all day. That can get really boring. So you want to learn how to do it all. It'll kind of mix it up. Doesn't Mm -hmm. make the day so boring. And is that why you're so attracted to the fit up aspect of it? Like on tunnels, you usually get contracted to, to do fit up, right? It's a bit more challenging Mm -hmm. than just pulling the trigger. And you know, I'm I'm not talking shit on people that are just welding. I just can't, I can do it, Mm -hmm. but I find it more challenging to have to get into some on the last, on the last reliner that we did for uh, JF Shea. Mm -hmm. Northwest pipe drew the drawings backwards. They were upside down. We had a sweeping downhill right hand turn and they had it on the drawings as a sweeping up left hand. Yeah. Uphill left hand turn. <laughs> or just turn the print over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was in the pipe looking at the prints like this. Through light. Interesting. Yeah. And, uh, we got the can in there and it was mitered backwards and we actually popped it open in, in a, 
for your listeners on a reliner and me and, <laughs> and Josh, yeah. they'll they'll take a, a piece of a piece of pipe and cut it long ways, and then they they roll it over itself so it's a smaller diameter, so they can drive it inside mm. the existing pipeline on on their cart, and then it has um, steel bands on the outside to hold it together. And there's grout ports for the annular space to grout, and you'll take the grout plugs out and cut the cut the bands on it, and it expands. There's some stored energy in it. Oh, it fucking dude, it it pops. It is violent. Yeah, yeah. I smashed my finger in one one time like an idiot. <laughs> well, what's, that, what's that old saying? Never put your fingers anywhere you wouldn't put your pecker. Yeah, I did that. Yeah. I forgot about that rule. <laughs> so <clears throat> we we pop this can open and. uh JT's over there looking at the miter, and he's all, this thing's starting to turn the opposite way that we need to go. So we fucking curled it back up with come-alongs and got it out of the pipe. We're looking at the plans, and we go out to the yard and look at all the pipe. It's all fucking built backwards. And we're all, hmm. And then the whole fucking thing gets shut down, you know. Engineers start coming out, and they have to reevaluate what's going on. And, uh... They made the decision to lay the pipe. They kind of mixed them all up, but we laid it backwards. When you're inside of there, you'll uh, there it, it fits together like bell spigot, you know. Okay. So you'll pop a can, and the spigot expands inside the bell, so you can fit it. They said, "Oh, you're gonna have to lay this backwards." So we'd have to turn the pipe around, bring it in with the bell in towards the inside and then pop the can weld the bell out Mm -hmm. to stab it into the spigot and then you're guessing on the size you know your your root opening kind of determines the size of your bell and then you'd have to take hydraulics and pull it into the fucking bell it was a it was a pain in the ass but we got it done but it's a it's just a it's more of a challenge you know Mm -hmm. So that's a fun day at the office. For it does. Them. It doesn't yeah. always go as planned and it gets your brain working. Mm-hmm. So you're thinking of different ways to do things. I think. Yeah. I, I like your point on, on uh, drowning in the monotony. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. And I think it's important for people to, to challenge. And it's a word that you, that you use often in, in challenging your, what you know and challenging what you don't know in that, in, in developing that growth I completely agree with you in the fact that a lot of people start Monday racing to Friday Mm -hmm. and they get there as fast as they can and efficiently as they can doing as little as As they they can can. um, because they want to punch that Friday time clock. And like you said, get fucked up or YOLO man. (laughs) It's funny. You 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 just say I never thought I'd hear something (laughs) dumb like that come out of Holden's mouth. That's brilliant. (laughs) Um, I, so I think a, uh, for me, an, another part of um, of narrative that kind of feeds that action is is um, well, I'll do more when they pay me more, kind of thing. I'll learn when they pay you know pay me to do it. And I think that mindset, what the, what you're really doing is you're allowing someone, you're giving someone control, you're allowing someone to dictate your value, mm-hmm. which means you have no ownership of yourself and what you can do and what you're willing to learn. I like you, I went to every training, every class, ev- everything that I could do in in my craft. I did. I I joke. I tell people I got I got forty years experience in twenty years. Um, overtime because of the overtime, <laughs> but because of the knowledge, the conversations, the old timers that I learned from, mm-hmm. um, and compressing that knowledge. So, but I think people are like you. Again, they have that sense of. They they'll do more when they're paid more, and it's like yeah. you reverse that formula. I think it's hard to have a mentality like that and get anywhere. I yeah. I completely agree. Well, and uh, those same people that even if you did give them more, they would justify why they got more money, and they wouldn't use it to mm-hmm. to do anything better. Mm-hmm. They'd be like, "Well, it's about time they they understand my worth." And yeah, it's like, shut the fuck up, <laughs> god damn it. But again, you're the the ceiling that people put on themselves. Yep. And instead of using a simple metric of what somebody else is paying you, your metric holding, you're talking about, you have information, you have value that you get no matter where you go. 
Mm-hmm. Like that's your information. That's your value. That's your skill set. That's your ability. And applying that to the things that you do every day just builds that experience. It's like, yeah. it's far well, more valuable than someone telling me I'm worth X number of dollars. Yeah. Well, and right, you know, we talked about scarcity mindset earlier. These are the same people that use scarce scarcity mindset in the other direction. They're like, I am the scarcity. You're lucky that I show up here every week. You know, like that, that is the mentality <laughs> these people walk with us with your presence yes. and therefore Thank we you pay you for one. your time. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. I think that you can find out really quick if somebody's got that mindset or not. Right. Very yeah. Quick. It shows up in behavior. Yeah. Shows up in behavior. Are we here to do a fucking job or are we here just to fucking get through? It's a mentality, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that was part of the being on the road for us. That was such a good thing. It was like, I don't fucking want to be in Atalanta right now. Oh, God, I hate that place. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. I don't want to be here. Yeah. So we would show up and they're like, dude, you guys don't have to work this fast. Mm -hmm. It's like, the fuck we don't. I don't want to stay in this hotel where you heard gunshots every night. Like, I don't want to fucking be here. So we knew that we were the only ones that could go out there and do the fucking job. Dean's didn't have anybody else to send. So you can get it done and get out of there. Get it done and get the fuck out. People. I don't, I keep saying people like they're just all one fucking group, but (laughs) a lot of people, they, uh, they try to make the job last. Oh, Hey, slow Mm -hmm. down, make it last. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they get paid by the hour. There's, I, I have, some paper in my truck. I keep writing down shit that I hate hearing on job sites. You get paid by the hour. That's one of them. What? I can't see it from my house. That's another one of them. Why? Why? What? Yeah. What encouraged you to start writing that down? Where the fuck did these sayings come from? <laughs> so you, some lazy yeah. ass motherfucker made that up. Oh, I can't see it from my house. Who cares if it yeah. looks like shit? Yeah. But, uh, that that right there, Holden, that yeah. right there is why it is so difficult to unpack you in an hour. Because that's a, a to me, that's just a, a glimpse into like how you think and how that feeds your performance and how you evaluate the performance of others. And you're literally writing shit down that you fucking yeah. hate to. I dude, I fucking love that. I yeah. think it's absolutely brilliant. Um but it's those little nuances in your behavior and in the behaviors of high performers that set you apart and anyone that's not a high performer is like well, that's fucking stupid right it's like no he's collecting data <laughs> like literally <laughs> if you if you hear somebody say that you know right away that they're fucking right just doing the bare minimum yeah. right well let me ask you this what what is your biggest challenge as a high performer when you get onto a job and you're dependent upon this other crew to do their shit but they're all a bunch of slapdicks like what is your biggest hurdle you have to overcome in that realm um i found that a lot of the time if you don't try to insult them it works better you know (laughs) but it's so hard not to (laughs) it's pretty yeah Yeah. sometimes it's very challenging not to insult Mm -hmm. people but they'll kind of give you the reins and let you yes and and, and let you help them Mm -hmm. they'll say you know if you come at them if you come at them like, hey, you're a fucking idiot. What are you doing over here? They'll that, just right away well. they'll, they'll just right away shut you down and fucking. Scoutmaster talk to Kevin? You. Yeah. No, what? <laughs> <laughs> but if you come at them kind of from at a different angle, and you know yeah. Like you're trying to help. Oh, it's leadership. It, yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Like you're trying People to help them. You're trying want to, to be led. Yeah. Om- almost like it was their idea. Like who gives a fuck whose idea it so, is as yeah, long but, as we can get this fucking ball rolling. Right. So you're planting the seed of the idea. And la- like you make it so blatant that there's no way that they can't develop this concept on their own. And right? a lot of the time, patience is a virtue, you know. And I've gotten, I've, I, you know what I've, I have noticed that you have developed that over the years, but when you first started, I had kids, dude, you were the most impatient motherfucker I'd ever met in my life. You're like, we're fucking going now. And there was no stopping him, you know? Yeah. uh, Being in a marital relationship and also having kids, Mm -hmm. you like have to develop that patience. Right. It's either that or you strangle them. And it's, and it's helped me with my career as Mm -hmm. far. Mm -hmm. I think it's helped me with my career, but I've, I've noticed a difference. 
I think it's easier to be more patient because you got to let them run through all their dumbass ideas. Mm-hmm. And then eventually they'll just come around yes. and be like, oh. Well, somebody had to let you run through your dumbass ideas at some point, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 and I've had a lot of dumbass ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing that I appreciate about what you said was is in Nate's example, you don't show up and push your agenda. You're not you're not pushing your idea and pushing your agenda out of the gate. I don't care if it's mine. As long like Ex- there's yes. more than one way to skin a cat. It's just so long as we can get moving in a direction that's beneficial mm-hmm. to everybody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially, I mean, it, when we go out on a job site and we're making a like a piece price, and the contractor's taking forever to get the fucking pipe in the ground or get the joint set or whatever, it's hard to come at them. It's not beneficial to come at them aggressively most people, of the time. People don't respond to that shit. And I can get kind of aggressive. What? Well, that 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 kind of leads me into my next question. What do you think your biggest flaw is? Your biggest fault? Probably my mouth. <laughs> D- <laughs> I got like four examples off the top of my fucking yeah. head. Easily. It's me yeah. saying shit that I shouldn't have said. You know, if I would have just stayed quiet, it would have been way better. Yeah. But at least, at least you're able to analyze that and understand that and course correct. Right. Cause I mean, there, dude, I'm not going to fucking tell you the stories on here, but like some of the shit that, that he said, I'm just like, what the fuck did you just say? And, Like I, after he said it, I'm like, yeah, I get that. You know, like it made sense. Whatever you said made sense. Most of the time it's true, but (laughs) it's, you know, you patience, Mm -hmm. you got to have some patience Yeah, and you got to be wise with your words. Interesting. Yep. No, that's good. I mean, that's good self-awareness. What, um, was there anything that we haven't touched on that you want to talk about or share or give advice? I don't have any advice. <laughs> That's the best advice. I don't have any. Yeah. yeah. It's the more you know, the less you know, you know? Yep. Yeah. That I, that I, that's I it. Believe, that's yeah. the unfortunate reality of the really world. Is. I, every day I wake up and I feel just a little bit dumber. Man. <laughs> yeah. I hope we can keep the trades going and get young guys in it, into it. And, you know, all his infrastructure work, it's not going away completely, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can throw all the robots you want at yeah. it. But. Well, being raised the way that, that we were in the trades, what is it that people need to be doing now to attract, the, you know, that new generation? I don't have the answers. The new generation should stay off their phone at work. Mm-hmm. There's multiple guys, you know, there's multiple young men that I've seen. And when they have nothing to do or they think they have nothing to do, right. they just whip their phone out and start fucking around on it. And you just want to take it from them and throw it in the bushes or <laughs> break it. Because these, yeah, it, and it's probably not even their fault. Well, it's just become habit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They it, just, it's habitual. They've when, had it since they were three. When yeah. people have nothing, when these individuals have nothing to do, they immediately pull their cellular device out and start fucking off on it and burning up time. They're not thinking to themselves, if they, wouldn't, if they didn't have the phone, they would just leave it in the truck when they would go to grab it. How about this? Put a little note on your hand that says, find something to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sweep the floor. Yeah. Fucking, yeah. you know. Whatever, polish the fire truck. I don't care what you yeah. do. Don't stand there on your phone. You look like a dumbass. I used to work for a guy, and he said, do something even if it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And there's always something to do. Always. Always. Dude, I mean, especially in the pipeline game, dude, like our phones didn't work underground anyway. Like you'd have to go all the way up to your truck to even get your phone. Yeah, I just left mine in the truck because what happens is – Dude, this welding is, splatter gets dude, stuck on it, and then the fucker don't work. This is by by far the hardest motherfucker to get a hold of, too. Like, you'll call him, and he'll call you back in three to five working business days, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. But because he, he's not attached to his device, and you're one of those rare people that isn't glued to that. 
you know, like you'll look it up while you're working on something. You'd be like, Oh, how do, how the fuck do I put mm-hmm. this here? Okay, cool. And then the phone goes down and then you go back to work. But the, the technology is a great platform to be able to learn off of. And it's right in your pocket. I mean, that's mm-hmm. awesome. At the same time, disconnect from it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also something to be said about having the information and the, and the knowledge that you gain out of that phone. But if you're so fucking tied up in the goddamn phone that you're not applying the knowledge to anything, it's useless. Well, I've learned a lot of shit off YouTube. But then you go and do but it. You're applying it. Yeah, you're applying yeah. it. You go out and you fucking do the shit. But that's the problem is that people are like, oh, that's how that works. On to the next video. I know I know that it'd be difficult for you guys not to have the social media, but I don't I don't have it, you know. Yeah. Dude, there's I find so much shit on like Instagram that I want to send you all the time, and I'm like, God damn it! Like, you, yeah. I wish you wish you had one, but I'm like, even if he had it, he'd check it once every six months. You know, how is it? How do you prioritize your time? Th- the things that you do because I'm, you you I'm, have no attraction to social media, which I, I'm terrible at prioritizing my time. What you do just then just minimize the things that you do. You just like you do three things, and you just do those three things well. No, <laughs> like well husband dad like truck builder <laughs> typically if if i have a whole bunch of shit to do writing it down fucking helps me mm-hmm. taking a yellow pad writing it down crossing it off because if i don't do that i won't even i i won't ever get that done it'll get lost in the ether or it, whatever it'll get lost done. you you have a million people calling you they're all wanting you to come do something you can easily forget where the mm-hmm. fuck you need to direct your attention well especially being a guy like you because i know when i call you my intention is i know holden will do it you know and so i know that every other contractor that fucking calls you they're like i know holden will do it so then now you have this plethora of people that are like hey we need this fucking thing done and now you have to sort through that shit right as far as it just you uh, you'll accumulate saying yes to so much stuff that you'll forget about what you need to do and it's easy. Instead of pulling your phone out, you pull a piece of paper out and it does nothing. But <laughs> That's all it does. Yeah, yeah, it does nothing. You can read what you wrote down and you're like, hey, I haven't gotten that done. Instead of pulling your phone out when you have nothing to do, fuck, pull a piece of paper out with uh, some shit jotted down on it that you need to do. Mm-hmm. Makes it easy. I think that's single-handedly the best piece of advice that I've ever heard on this fucking (laughs) podcast. It's like, get a fucking notepad, write your shit down. Instead of grabbing your phone, grab the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. If any kid coming up right now is listening to this and wants a leg up in the trade, that is the best piece of advice you could possibly get. Some of the things that are on the list take 10 minutes, you know? Mm -hmm. But you can still cross it off. You'll watch kids, you'll watch the younger generation pull their phone out and burn fucking two hours on it. Mm Mm-hmm. Just sitting there, uh, their tongue sticking out, watching fucking TikTok or whatever. Yeah, you know what the what the average screen time is now for a person on on a in a week on a seven days? I do not know. Five hours a day. No. What, it, what, what is, is it? More than that? Sixty hours a week. What the you fucking know, fuck? I was listening to uh, Mike Rowe, a mm-hmm. podcast that he was doing, and they said that there is. 7 million working age males that are out of work on their own accord. Mm -hmm. And they spend an average of 2000 hours a year on Xbox or whatever screens. Jesus fucking. I didn't want to, I didn't want to know that fucking stat. Dude, that (laughs) bums me out. 7 million working. Able, able, able body body working age males. Fucking. So you, Christ. yeah, I listened to the same you, one. You hear that, and is it, that the way I heard it? Right. The he was a podcast? guest. He, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't remember. I, I listened to a bunch of them. So, yeah. Yeah. and like I said, you know, I'm not, I'm no saint. You know, I'll get on this phone while I'm driving. I listen to podcasts. Mm-hmm. There's only so much of the same. That's not. It's not being on your phone though. Like, yeah, there. I feel like if you're gonna spend Scrolling. time, if you're gonna use time with that. That's the absolute mm-hmm. best way you can spend time with it, right? Well, Having podcasts it, it, it's on. still on your phone. And I mean, you're using the technology that you have mm-hmm. to benefit you. Listen yeah. to these people. They got mm-hmm. a lot of good, a lot of good advice online. Do you listen to Goggins at all? David Goggins? Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, fucking, he's <laughs> one hard motherfucker. Fucking different fucking creature, yeah. man. I, he's hard. My <laughs> stay hard. <motherfucker>. Yeah. My <laughs> perspective of him changed when I read his first book. The can't hurt me. Yeah. Yeah. I gained 
I actually respected him after I read that book yeah. because because he just seems like an internet fucking mouthpiece, right. and then you're like, oh, he actually did the fucking yeah. work, and he doesn't like that he's an internet mouthpiece. He fucking right. hates that shit. Yeah, um, D- doesn't he like uh, he takes the uh, negative comments from Instagram and records them on his phone, and he listens to that while he runs. Like, like yeah, it's fuel for yeah, him. Yeah. yeah. But I um, I completely changed my perspective after I read. I uh, read his book, and he just come out with a second one. Did he? Uh, yeah. Okay. That I, I don't know if it's a sequel to the first, or I don't know that much about it yet, but it's on my I got a fucking list of books to read a mile long. Dude, but, everybody thinks I'm more of a reader than I am, and everybody wants to give me a it's book. because you just articulate yourself so well, I, clearly, and you yeah, so I'm smart. Biggest swinging dick on the yard, the, you know? Yeah. The, a star of this I think show. I, yeah, clearly, the, the star... <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to the first episode and somebody oh, told God. me that he has a face for radio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, most certainly do. Yeah. Accurate. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Holden, thanks for spending this time with us, man. I know yeah. that you're kind of passing through, kind of worked for them a little bit. But... Dude, there's, there's nothing like getting this motherfucker out in the field with our guys. Like you want to see a fire under their ass. Mm-hmm. They spend any amount of, like, I remember watching Grant after you came up with the Meeks Bay job. Dude, these guys look up to you, like, in this realm that I can't even fathom. Like, they look at you like some sort of divine figure. Because, I mean, we talk we talk you up all the time, but then you get out there and you fucking, you put the proof in the pudding, you know? And I love it when you come up here. Even if we only get you for a couple of days, I love the lasting effect that you have on our crew. I think that when young guys when they first start out, they're a bit intimidated by guys that have been in the trade a little bit. Mm-hmm. When I was just starting out, I definitely was. Mm-hmm. I come to a job site and meet Nate, this big old burly motherfucker with a beard, smoking a cigarette <laughs> while he's fucking welding <laughs> under his hood. Yeah. Under his, underneath his hood, he's smoking it. a cigarette welding away. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, that guy's fucking crazy. You know? <laughs> and then I got to know him and he's a pretty cool fucking guy, you yeah. know, but definitely just, the image is intimidating mm-hmm. when you meet this big old burly motherfucker on a job site and he's like, Hey, get down there and weld that fucking pipe. It's fit. <laughs> You're like, okay. I think he did a better job than fucking Derek. <laughs> Derek. <laughs> uh, I love when people impersonate you. It makes me happy. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, it is. It is intimidating. And a, a little intimidation is good. You can go along yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like it's mm-hmm. motivating. Yeah. Right. You're like, how do I, how do I get that guy to see me as my equal, right? Mm-hmm. And you want to do because they're the same thing. I worked under Zach, yeah. You know, and this dude is fucking Zach. When he was welding, was just fucking on another level. Mm-hmm. The dude was so good at systematizing everything, and it was like the intelligence came out. And I'm like, dude, I thought this was a knuckle dragger profession. And then you get into the pipeline game and you have to figure out systems and do everything as efficiently as possible so you can make the most amount of money while you're doing it. Well, reducing all the inefficiencies you can is good. Yeah. Man. Fuck yeah, it is. And it dude, like that instilled something in us that And you gotta consistently be thinking about taking inefficiencies out. Yeah. It's not just it doesn't happen by itself. You, right. You well, how can I make this better? Intentionally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Be deliberate. Yeah. That's something that uh, John Maxwell, um, when I got into reading and studying leadership, John Maxwell was like, he's like the leadership guy on the planet. Yeah. And, you know, he was talking about people's mindset is, well, if it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And he said, the mindset you have to have is if it ain't broke, how can we make it better? Mm -hmm. That's what humans are constantly doing. Mm Yeah. I mean, there was somebody, I think it was Jordan Peterson. Uh, I was watching an interview that he was doing, and he was like, if you gave humans the utopia that they're always striving for, where all they had to care about was fucking and eating, they would destroy it immediately. Because we have to have the unknown, right? We have to have the stimulation, the mental stimulation. We don't work well in this floaty. Utopia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when things are good, we're, do that, 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 you ever notice that ebb and flow of your life? Like, things get good. And then all of a sudden they just start tanking again. Which one's high? Is it ebb or flow? Fuck, fuck me. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out how long <laughs> how long this valley in my life is right now. I'm like, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. I'm either stuck in the ebb or the flow. I don't right. know which it is. But right. Yeah, you're right. It but seems we, like it's forever. We, we almost like subconsciously destroy it because we need to be stimulated. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like, dude, we're on top. Everything's fucking great. 
And then how does it always fall apart? It's whatever actions we make. We get complacent. We don't fucking pay attention to shit. And then all of a sudden, life goes to shit again. But you ever notice mm-hmm. that you're almost more happy? When you have pressure. Clawing your way out of that? Mm-hmm. Pressure's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Learning how to deal with pressure is harder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, that's a, I mean, that in itself is a skill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Your example, uh, a couple of, of the examples that you give, but it's like being in that mindset of still problem solving regardless of the circumstance or the pressure and not dragging up or not quitting or not blaming or being able to to perform at that at that level i think there's harmony in chaos uh, i think i think being i think if it was if there was no chaos it would it would be simple so i think there's harmony in in chaos and being able to operate at that pressure i don't want to go to work and have everything just be easy all the time then i'd be then i'd be the guy that's like god damn it when's friday gonna roll along so i can get drunk (laughs) yeah you gotta have a bit of a challenge yeah Yeah. so last question for you i know you talked about going to portland at some point and to that pipe machining and i'm i know i'm fucking it up but anyway what what else do you do what are you doing to kind of keep that edge and continuing to grow and educate yourself outside of the daily grind. You just try to pick up on anything that you can pick up on and try not to be arrogant to older gentlemen, because when they like listeners, he pointed at Nate when he said that. (laughs) (laughs) You go ahead. Old old guy, you know, the guys that have been in these trades, they don't want to fucking teach you. If you're a little pecker Mm chili, they'll show you shit. If you ask, but you got to fucking they, ask. They will. Yeah. They will. Yeah. Gotta, yeah. I think they that's such you, a great point. They will show you shit if you mm-hmm. ask. Mm-hmm. Or if you seem like you're worth giving their effort to, yeah. they'll yeah. show you. Because that's the thing. Nobody wants to put the effort in but somebody that's yeah. not going to do if anything you don't, with it. We, we went over to this Russian guy, and he he spoke English. Not great. He he spoke, spoke fluid English, but you could definitely tell he was Russian. Mm-hmm. And there were a whole bunch of young young kids in there. 25, 24, and they weren't over surrounding the, they, I mean, they didn't go weld their joint up fast so they can go over there and see what the fuck he was doing. They had no interest in learning it. And we went over there and asked him, how do you do this? And he go, he literally broke it down for us and showed us. Interesting. Step by step. Step by step. Dude, he it, was probably pumped to fucking show somebody that. Yeah, I mean, he literally broke it down for us, spent half hour, and every day I'd, like, come back and see what he was doing, and he'd spend a little bit of time mm. telling us how and what he was doing, and we, all we did was ask. So, if you're interested, So go brilliant ask. and simple. Is that, is that the title of this one? <laughs> Just <laughs> fucking <laughs> ask? <laughs> so brilliant and yeah. simple. Uh, Nate? In closing, what do you think, man? Oh fuck, dude! Hey, thank you so much for coming up, man. No, oh, thank you, you guys know, for having me. I love having you. I love having you up here and uh, you know get you out of SoCal for a little bit. It was and, a pleasure. It's fucking gorgeous outside right now. Yeah, it's almost a crime being yeah. in this little box. <laughs> I know. We've been on the motorcycles all morning, and yeah. uh, Nick was gracious enough to let Holden borrow the bike. And thank you, Nick. Yeah, <laughs> I haven't wrecked it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Still got to get home, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Then I like I said the the residual effect of you being here it it really sticks with our guys and it, I I really like what we've done with our company and the culture we've created that the presence of somebody like you hangs out with these guys it's and good. Like, they give a fuck you know. Well, I like that you can plug somebody like Holden in to the company mm-hmm. and into that culture and it's an immediate fit. Yep. Yeah. You know, I know Coleman's that way. Yep. You know, when dude, when anytime comes Coleman up, comes up here, dude, those guys are on that guy like fucking flies on shit. I think yeah. they're scared of you, but Coleman's just like this jolly dude that's like he's a little little more approachable, you know. They they know all the stories of Holden. I love so. Coleman. He's a good dude. Yes, dude. he is. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. approachable. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> you you just you see him and you just like he wants a hug. I want to hug that guy. <laughs> I want to hug yeah. that guy yeah. right now. <laughs> he's a good dude. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. a good dude. So, well, dude, um, Holden, it's, yeah. um, I, I think I met you at his at Nate's wedding, right? Yeah, that's you, right. Yeah, we, we spoke briefly, um, and that's the entirety of the interaction that I've had with you. So, um, it's awesome for you to come in here, share your story, 
And uh, I, I mean, you know, half this conversation, I've got to sit back and just watch you guys mm-hmm. reminisce and tell stories and bullshit. But, dude, it's awesome to see you again, and I appreciate you being in here. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Nate? You done? I'm done. I'm done. You can find Nate on Instagram at Nate Newton 87. I am on Instagram at the Tradesman Experience. Email is the Tradesman Experience at gmail.com. Website's the Tradesman Experience.com. And the YouTube channel is the Tradesman Experience. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Get out there, get shit done. Be proud to be a tradesman. See you.